When I uh, started raising canola, there wasn't a lot of places to sell it. And Central Washington grain growers stepped up and they started providing seed. And uh, Howard has been head of their, well, all sorts of weird crops, <laughs> oil seeds and stuff, and they run their own test plots. And, and Howard has did a lot to help uh, create alternative crops for farmers all throughout Central Washington, but especially North Central Washington. Uh, he's located out of Wilbur, and I think Central Washington Grain Growers has headquarters in both Waterville and Wilbur. So Howard sells seed and buys seed. Well, good afternoon, and, and thank you, Wade. And I just like to say that I have the privilege of working with a lot of great farmers, which include Tom and, and Wade both. And uh, I always uh, like getting out of the, out of the office. Uh, I was hired as a marketing and uh, agronomist. I prefer to think of myself as an agronomist and then and then a marketer. Uh, but. Uh, uh, Scott Yates called me, if you know Scott, uh, about a month ago doing an article, and he said, uh, well, you know, Howard, you've been in the canola business for 20 years, and I had to stop and think, well, yeah, well, I have been in the canola business for 20 years. Uh, there was a couple times you've heard mentioned uh, at the conference Intermountain Canola. Well, I was part of that, uh, that group with Intermountain Canola. I was a, a production agronomist, uh, at that point in time, uh, and covered uh, covered the Northern Plus area uh, and, and Bonners Ferry, Idaho, which is a which is a unique area all by itself. But uh, uh, you know, one of the things that really wasn't covered here today very much was uh, marketing. Uh, you know, uh, they they showed the economics and and uh, they've talked a lot about uh, of agronomy. You know, that's that's only half. That's half the picture. You know, the other half is, is marketing. <clears throat> and so like Wade said that, uh, that we, uh, we provide the seed and we buy it, well, uh, I'm the person that uh, puts out the daily price. You know, I say, well, I'm gonna buy canola today at 17.80 and Wade always says I want more. And, uh, and so that's, that's part of my job is to, to find a market uh, for, the, for the canola uh, and uh, the other part of that is uh, whoever I sell it to, I want to make sure I get paid. And uh, so it may not always be the highest price that's out there, but it's a price where I know uh, I'm going to be able to pay the growers and I'm going to get paid and, and everything is working right. And, uh, and it keeps the general manager off my back. Uh, but um, the one thing about marketing, uh, is that uh, it's, it's an evolving market with wheat and some of these other crops, pretty mature markets, a lot of buyers and a lot of sellers. You know, we don't have that in canola. Uh, we had two, two buyers. Uh, uh, when I first started uh, marketing with canola, you know, it all went to Lethbridge, Canada. And, uh, you know, we, we had considerable freight on that. Uh, things have improved quite a bit now that we have a local uh, canola industry. But, uh, you know, as time evolves, we'll be able to add some more marketing options for you guys. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm a licensed commodity broker, so, uh, you know, we do get basis bids. Uh, so we'll be able to ex expand some of the marketing tools that we have to offer. The other thing, uh, you know, as far as varieties go, uh, one of the things, if I can help the growers make more money, it makes more money for Central Washington grain growers. Because if somebody hauls a wheat rye mix in, into our company, uh, the grower's not happy because he's gonna have severe discounts uh, on his grain. Uh, it creates problems for us because we have to keep it separate from everything else. We can't put it in the same bin. So by helping these guys grow a better crop, it also helps us as a, as a company at the same time. So, that's pretty much all I have to say, unless there's any questions. I have one, Howard. What's the price of canola today? What did you post today? <laughs> well, I'd have to check with the main office in Waterville because they were supposed to do that. But 
Uh, you know, I, I don't exactly know uh, because I'm not connected with the internet uh, here this afternoon, but it's it's somewhere around the, the 2750 uh, price uh, at the current time. Paul, did you have a question? In their rainfall, we've got uh, had a grower say to me in deeper ground, I believe. But, uh, you know, I was going to plant barley this spring, and maybe I ought to take a look at spring canola. You want to talk about this? Is all winter, so you guys have. Growing. Right. You want to talk a little bit about what would spring canola look like in some of our three foot or deeper soil? Okay. Well, I'm going to talk uh, main, for the 12 inch rainfall and less zone. Okay. And uh, my experience in the past is the brassica napus varieties really don't do very well in that in that rainfall area. Uh, we get a lot of cold nights, and so we, first of all, we have a problem with uh, seedling tolerance to, to cold. And then the second thing is when it blooms, it's usually pretty hot. And uh, you heard him say anything over 85 degrees, you know, you'll, you'll get those blanks and, uh, and you'll suffer uh, with, with pollination. Uh, so now we have a, a Brassica gensia, uh, clear field type uh, with canola quality. And uh, I've, I've leaned that direction because uh, I, I, feel, I feel that it's better to get maybe a crop with a little lower yield that that offers versus having a freeze out and having, having no crop or, or a heat issue uh, with spring canola. So, uh, you know, Wade said we do it. I have a small testing program. I've got a small plot drill, small plot combine. And so I'm going to include uh, some of these other varieties, the Brassica gensia and the Brassica napus varieties together, and then we'll actually have data and, and uh, yield performance uh, information from, from that zone. So then to carry it on a little farther with the herbicide, part of the reason these guys grow a, a spring crop in these areas is, is one is rotation, two is they got grassy weed problems I've been doing. Do you think with the, without using the Roundup Readies and without going to the beyond, they're sure post that they would have a, a fair success story of reducing uh, seed load? Yeah, the, the question is about uh, grassy weed control and a uh, and spring cropping rotation. Uh, it, my past uh, uh, problem with Assure 2s and stuff is uh, they've been aerial applied uh, with low volumes of water. And so we haven't always had good success with our grassy weed control with aerial applications. Now, if you go with, with a ground rig and uh, get your, your water volumes up to, to 15 gallons, you know, that greatly improves the, the uh, uh, efficacy that, that, uh, that you need to get. Uh, you know, it's, you know, even, even spring wheat's not a great crop. Uh, in a lot of these areas. It's, it's just kind of a, you know, we need to control the weeds and so we're, we're gonna grow spring wheat. And so, so if, if we can't grow spring wheat, uh, it really limits us on what we can do with a broadleaf crop in that area. Kind of along the line of what you're asking is last spring I took my weedy field and I put uh, Brassica gensia. Howard got it. It's uh, exceed cropland genetics. Uh, oasis. It, it's uh, the oasis, and it was uh, beyond tolerant. So I was able to spray it pre-plant with Roundup, which took care of all the grass and weeds out there. And then in crop, I was able to spray it with beyond. And everything was looking good. Bloomed the whole month of June. Uh, it was supposed to be resistant to frost, which frost wasn't a problem. It was supposed to be resistant to uh, drought, and that was okay. But <laughs> the problem with spring canola is Wade was 10 miles to the south of me, Ten Townsend's were 10 miles to the north of me, and all the cabbage seed pod weevil left theirs and came to mine. And I hardly had a pod that hadn't been done. And it still yielded 700 pounds, which at 30 cents isn't too bad on a recrop situation for us. But uh, had I been aware of the problem of the cabbage seed pod weevil, uh, I'm sure I would have been 
1,100 pounds. So, yeah, there's different management practices that you'll run into in doing a spring, but I really think the spring gives us another option. I don't know what your climate is. The, the limiting factor of, for us on spring grains is our ground stays cold for so long. And we're talking 48 degrees and north in latitude and fairly high elevations that we have difficulty getting a spring wheat crop to come up and tiller out before we get a heat wave. So we're looking at, you know, maybe it not really coming through the ground until the 1st of May, and then maybe it being 100 degrees the 1st of June. And that hurts our spring yields. So that's probably more of a limiting factor in the north part of the state is, is for spring, any type of spring crop is the distance between that last day of frost and that first 100 degree day. There, there, we don't have a lot of them, and I envy the guys down around Ritzville and in the horse heavens, and they tell me they're in the fields in the March, you know, and it's unheard of. We're still got drifts on the ground in March. So. Yeah, this, this particular place is uh, west of Ritzville and north of I-90. So I think, it, you know, where you have a better chance of raising spring grain, you're going to have a better chance of, of raising uh, competitive canola. Uh, we're just, the other problem, and if I may speak, is what I ran into with spring wheat and somewhat with barley is some of our ground was so rye infested that we got a later germination of rye. And so we started getting another mutant of rye that, that started growing, germinated in May and would head out with the spring wheat. So even our, but that's because we couldn't come in there with the use of Roundup to clean it up without taking up the spring wheat. So, um, rye, well, all of our weeds we found have the ability to mutate over time. And I'm sure it's not the same rye that my grandfather raised. The rye that we deal with now is a very wild, it shatters out way before harvest, uh, produces thousands of seeds that lay there on the ground and their germination rate is maybe 40% or so this year and another 20 or so the following year. So it's persistent in the soil for a long time. And I don't have goat grass, but I, I think it's got the same qualities, doesn't it? Pretty much, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, uh, the one reason that I chose the oasis was because of all the grassy weed and herbicides I'd used on that particular field. I couldn't go with a normal around the British spring variety, which I think characteristically yield better. But because of the herbicide carryover, I was pretty well limited. And so that part of it worked. It was so a not sound, effective. Sounds like maybe a recommendation for this guy would be chem foul in the spring, plant your winter crop up earlier in the fall or summer when you can still reach moisture before it gets too hot, and grow a winter crop of rather than canola where you still have an arsenal of chemicals for grass and weed control and keep your 160 acres in rotation and still have the same benefits. Does that sound like a better scenario for a you know, everybody's going to have to figure out their own scenario. Is there more questions for Howard? I mean, you've got a guy that he calls me up all the time and he says, oh, Wade, do I have a deal for you? I got. <laughs> but, uh, and Howard is being very honest where if he calls me up and says, you know, Wade, I can get you 28 cents a pound for canola today. I usually say, well, it must going to be 30 next week, so <laughs> <laughs> call me back. <laughs> but uh, he, he's very good.